Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is the 14th of the 12th month, what they commonly call Adar today, but that was not ever original. And this is uh, the, the second day of Perum for those who observe it. And we're going to be reading through Hadasha or Esther. This is going to be the Greek version, which has the additional parts that are missing from the Hebrew. So chapter one, this is Mordecai's vision. And up above, it gives context that the numbers are off from the canonical books because Jerome's Latin translation. So don't mind the numbers being different. This is chapter one, Mordecai's dream. In the second year of the reign of Artaxerxes the Great, on the first day of Nisan, or Abib, the first month of the year, Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimni, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, had a dream. He was a Yahudi living in the city of Susa, a great man serving in the court of the king. He was one of the captives whom sovereign Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had brought from Yerushalayim with sovereign Yakon Yahu of Yahuda. And this was his dream. Noises and confusion, thunders and earthquake, tumult on the earth. Then two great dragons came forward, both ready to fight, and they roared terribly. At their roaring, every nation prepared for war to fight against the righteous nation. It was a day of darkness and gloom, of tribulation and distress, affliction and great tumult on the earth. And the whole righteous nation was troubled. They feared the evils that threatened them and were ready to perish. Then they cried out to Elohim, and at their outcry, as though from a tiny spring, there came a great river with abundant water. Light came, and the sun rose, and the lowly were exalted and devoured those held in honor. Mordecai saw in this dream that Elohim had, or what Elohim had determined to do. And after he awoke, he had it on his mind, seeking all day to comprehend it in every detail. Now Mordecai took his rest in the courtyard of Gabatha and Terah, the two eunuchs of the king who kept watch in the courtyard. He overheard their conversation and inquired into their purposes and learned that they were preparing to lay hands on sovereign Arxerxes. And he informed the king concerning them. Then the king examined the two eunuchs, and after they had confessed it, they were led away to execution. The king made a permanent record of these things, and Mordecai wrote an account of them. And the king ordered Mordecai to serve in the court, and rewarded him for these things. But Haman, the son of Hamadatha, a Bogdian, or a Bogian, sorry, who was in great honor with the king, determined to injure Mordecai and his people because of the two eunuchs of the king. It was after this that the following things happened in the days of Arxerxes. The same Arxerxes who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when sovereign Arxerxes was enthroned in the city of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for his friends and other persons of various nations, the Persians and Median nobles, and the governors of the provinces. After this, when he had displayed to them the riches of his kingdom and the splendor of his bountiful celebration during the course of 180 days, at the end of the festivity, 
the king gave a drinking party for the people of various nations who lived in the city. This was held for six days in the courtyard of the royal palace, which was adorned with curtains of fine linen and cotton, held by cords of purple linen, attached to gold and silver blocks on pillars of marble and other stones. In the Septuagint version, or the Breton Septuagint version, it mentions it's Pat, or Purian stone, I'm Purian marble. I'm not sure where that's from. But it says gold and silver couches were placed on a mosaic floor of emerald, mother of pearl, and marble. There were coverings of gauze embroidered in various colors with roses arranged around them. The cups uh, were of gold and silver, and a miniature cup was displayed made of ruby worth 30,000 talents. There was abundant sweet wine, such as the sovereign himself drank. The drinking was not according to a fixed rule, but or according to the law, but the king wished to have it so. And he commanded his stewards to comply with his pleasure and with that of the guests. Meanwhile, Queen Vasti, sorry, Vashati, gave a drinking party for the women in the palace where King Arxerxes was. On the seventh day, when the king was in good humor, he told Haman, Bazin, Tarah, Borez, Zatholath, or Zatholath, sorry, <laughs> Zatholtha, Abata, <laughs> Abataza, and Tharaba, the seven eunuchs who served King Arxerxes, to escort the queen to him in order to proclaim her as queen and to place the diadem on her head and to have her display her beauty to all the governors and the people of various nations, for she was indeed a beautiful woman. We're on verse 12 again, sorry about that. But Queen Vashti refused to obey him and would not come with the eunuchs. This offended the king, and he became furious, he said to his friends, this is how Vashti has answered me. Give, therefore, your ruling and judgment on this matter. Archisaeus, Sarsath, Aeus, and Malsear, then the governors of the Persians and Medes who were closest to the king, Archisaeus, Sarsathus, or Sarsathius, and Malsear, who sat behind him in the chief seats, came to him and told him what must be done to Queen Vashti for not obeying the order that the king had sent her by the eunuchs. Then Machaeus said to the king and the governors, Queen Vashti has insulted not only the king, but also all the king's governors and officials for he had reported to them what the queen had said and how she had defied the king. And just as she defied King Arxerxes, so now the other ladies who are wives of the Persian and Median governors, on hearing what she has said to the king, will likewise dare to insult their husbands. If therefore it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree inscribed in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, so that it may not be altered, that the queen may no longer come into his presence, but let the king give her royal rank to a woman better than she. Let whatever law the king enacts be proclaimed in his kingdom, and thus all women will give honor to their husbands rich and poor alike. This speech pleased the king and the governors, and the king did as Machaus had recommended. Machaus, yeah. 
The king sent the decree into all his kingdom, to every province, in its own language, so that in every house respect would be shown to every husband. All right, chapter two. It says, after these things, the king's anger abated, and he no longer was concerned about Vashti or remembered what he had said and how he had condemned her. Then the king's servants said, let beautiful and virtuous girls be sought out for the king. The king shall appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, and they shall select beautiful young virgins to be brought to the harem in Susa, the capital. And this says harem in this translation. The other one said the, the chamber of the women. All right. Let them be entrusted to the king's eunuch who is in charge of the women and let ointments and whatever else they need be given them. And the women who pleases the king, or sorry, and the woman who pleases the king shall be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king and he did so. Now there was a Yahudi in Susa the capital, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, son of Shimi, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin. He had been taken captive from Yerushalayim among those whom King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had captured. And he had a foster child, the daughter of his father's brother, Aminadab, and her name was Esther. When her parents died, he brought her up to womanhood as his own. The girl was beautiful in appearance. So the decree of the king was proclaimed, and many girls were gathered in Susa, the capital, in custody of Gai. Hadasha, or Esther, also was brought to Gai, who had custody of the women. The girl pleased him and won his favor and he quickly provided her with ointments and her portion of food, as well as seven maids chosen from the palace. He treated her and her maids with special favor in the harem. Now, Hadasha or Esther, had not disclosed her people or country, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in the courtyard of the harem to see what would happen to Esther. Now the period after which a girl was to go to the king was 12 months. During this time of days, the, the beautification are completed. Six months, they are anointing themselves with oil of myrrh, and six months with spices and ointments for women. Then she goes into the king, she is handed to the person appointed and goes with him from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she enters, and in the morning she departs to the second harem, where Guy, the king's eunuch, is in charge of the women. And she does not go into the king again unless she is summoned by name. When the time was fulfilled for Esther's daughter of Aminadab, the brother of Mordecai's father, to go in to the king. She neglected none of the things that Guy, the eunuch in charge of the women, had commanded. So Esther was the daughter of Aminadab, the brother of Mordecai's father. So she would have been his cousin, but she was so young, he adopted her as his daughter. And that's why she's of the line of Dawid, this of Yahuda, and he is of Benjamin or Benjamin. This is in the brother Mordecai's father go into the king. She neglected none of the things that Guy, the eunuch in charge of the women, had commanded. Now Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther went into King Arxerxes in the twelfth month which is Adar in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther, and she found favor beyond all the other virgins. 
So he put on her the queen's diadem. Then the king gave a banquet lasting seven days for all his friends and the officers to celebrate his marriage to Esther. And he granted a remission of taxes to those who were under his rule. All right, this is the plot discovered. Meanwhile, Mordecai was serving in the courtyard. Hadasha or Esther had not disclosed her country. Such were the instructions of Mordecai. But she was to fear Elohim and keep his laws, just as she had done when she was with him. So Esther did not change her mode of life. Now the king's eunuchs who were chief bodyguards were angry because of Mordecai's advancement, and they plotted to kill King Arxerxes. The matter became known to Mordecai, and he warned Esther, who in turn revealed the plot to the king. He investigated the two eunuchs and hanged them. Then the king ordered a memorandum. I'm sorry? All right, never mind. It's and then, not uh, flowing. And then the king ordered a memorandum to be deposited in the royal library in praise of the goodwill shown by Mordecai. Chapter 3. Mordecai refuses to do obscience or worship. Obscience, sorry. After these events, King Arxerxes promoted a man, son of Hamadatha, the Bogian, advancing him and granting him precedence over all the king's friends. So all who were at court used to do obscience or worship to Haman. For so the king had commanded to be done. Mordecai, however, did not do worship or obscenes. Then the king's courtiers said to Mordecai, Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he would not listen to them. So they informed Haman that Mordecai was resisting the king's command. Starting again at verse 4, sorry about that. It says, day after day they spoke to him, but he would not listen to them. Then they informed him man that Mordecai was resisting the king's command. Mordecai had told them that he was a Yahudi. So when Haman learned that Mordecai was not doing obscience or worship to him, he became furiously angry and plotted to destroy all the Yahudim under Arxerxes' rule. In the twelfth year of King Arxerxes, Haman came to a decision by casting lots, which would be Purim, like Jeanette was saying earlier, taking the days and the months one by one to fix on one day to destroy the whole race of Mordecai. The lot fell on the 14th day of the month of Adar, or the 12th month. Then Haman said to King Arxerxes, Then Haman said to King Arxerxes, There is a certain nation scattered among the other nations in your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other nation, and they do not keep the laws of the, of the king or sovereign. It is not expedient for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let it be decreed that they are to be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the king's treasury. So the king took off his signet ring and gave it to a man, to seal the decree that was to be written against the Yahudim. The king told Haman, 
keep the money and do whatever you want with that nation. So on the 13th day of the first month, which is the day before Pesach, this is something that I just learned this morning while reading with the children. But if you pay attention, it follows the fasting that our Mashiach and his taught ones are enjoined to do in the Apostolic Constitutions. This is so on the 13th day of the first month, the king's secretaries were summoned. And in accordance with Haman's instructions, they wrote in the name of King Arxerxes to the magistrates and the governors in every province from India to Ethiopia. There were 127 provinces in all, and the governors were addressed each in his own language. Instructions were sent by couriers throughout all the empire of Arxerxes to destroy the Yahudi people on the given day of the 12th month, which is Adar, and to plunder their goods. Now, in the regular scriptures, you don't have a copy of the letter, but in Josephus you do, and in the editions here you also have it. This is a copy of the letter. The great king Arxerxes writes the following to the governors of the 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia and to the officials under him. Having become ruler of many nations and master of the whole world, not elated with presumption of authority, but always acting. Sorry about that. So, reasonably and with kindness, I have determined to settle the lives of my subjects in lasting tranquility and in order to make my kingdom peaceable and open to travel throughout all its extent to restore the peace or shalom desired by all people. When I asked my counselors how this might be accomplished, a man who excels among us in sound judgment and is distinguished for his unchanging goodwill and steadfast fidelity and has obtained the second place in the kingdom, pointed out to us that among all the nations in the world, there is scattered a certain hostile people who have laws contrary to those of every nation and continually disregard the ordinances of kings, so that the unifying of the kingdom that we honorably intend cannot be brought about. We comprehend that this people, and it alone, stands constantly in opposition to every nation, perversely following a strange manner of life and laws, and is ill-disposed to our government doing all the harm they can so that our kingdom may not obtain stability. Therefore, we decree, or sorry, we have decreed that those indicated to you in the letters written by Haman, who is in charge of affairs and is our second father, shall all, wives and children included, be utterly destroyed by the be utterly destroyed by the swords of their enemies without pity or restraint on the 14th day of the 12th month, Adar, of this present year, so that those who have long been hostile and remain so may in a single day go down in violence to Hades and leave our government completely secure and untroubled hereafter. Copies of the document were posted in every province, and all the nations were ordered to be prepared for that day. The matter was expedited also in Susa, and while the king and Haman caroused together, the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Chapter 4 when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and sprinkled himself with ashes. Then he rushed through the street of the city, shouting loudly, An innocent nation is being destroyed. 
The other one says, a, a nation that has done no wrong is being destroyed by another or without cause. I think it was the whole thing. But he got as far as the king's gate, and there he stopped, because no one was allowed to enter the courtyard clothed in sackcloth and ashes. And in every province where the king's proclamation had been posted, there was a loud cry of mourning and lamentation among the Yahudim, and they put on sackcloth and ashes. When the queen's maids and eunuchs came and told her, she was deeply troubled by what she had heard had happened and sent some clothes to Mordecai to put on instead of sackcloth, but he would not consent. Then Esther summoned her Carathias, the eunuch who attended her, and ordered him to get accurate information from her or for her from Mordecai. So Mordecai told him that had happened and how Haman had promised to pay 10,000 talents into the royal treasury to bring about the destruction of the Yahudim. He also gave him a copy of what had been posted in Susa for their destruction to show to Esther, and he told him to charge her to go into the king and plead for his favor in behalf of the people. Remember, he said, the days when you were an ordinary person, being brought up under my care. For a man who stands next to the king has spoken against us and demands our death. Call upon Yahuwah, then speak to the king on our behalf, and save us from death. Ha-Cherathias went in and told Esther all these things, and she said to him, Go to Mordecai and say, All nations of the empire know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is no escape for that person. Only the one to whom the king stretches out the golden scepter is safe. And it is now 30 days since I was called to go to the king. When Har Karathis delivered her entire message to Mordecai. Mordecai told him to go back and say to her, Hadasha or Esther, do not say to yourself that you alone among all the Yahudim will escape alive. For if you keep quiet at such a time as this, help and protection will come to the Yahudim from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Yet who knows whether it was not for such a time as this that you were made queen. Then Esther gave the messenger this answer back to Mordecai. Go and gather all the Yahudim who are in Susa and fast on my behalf for three days and nights. Do not eat or drink, and my maids and I will also go without food. After that, I will go to the king, contrary to the law, even if I must die. So Mordecai went away and did what Esther had told him to do. Now, they got this news on the 13th of the first month. The 14th would have been Pesach, and then they would have had the three days and three nights of fasting like our Mashiach enjoined for his emissaries to do after they'd walked it out in his passion. And that was what they're supposed to teach all the taught ones, which is in the apostolic constitutions. And uh, for those that haven't gone over it, we will. We, we've done it a few times, but we'll go over it again. All right, this is Mordecai's prayer. Then Mordecai prayed to Yahuwah, calling to remembrance all the works of Yahuwah. He said, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, you rule as sovereign over all things, for the creation is in your power, and there is no one who can oppose you when it is your will to save or deliver Israel. For you have made Shemaim and earth and every wonderful thing under Shemaim. You are Yahuwah of all, and there is no one who can resist you, Yahuwah. 
you know all things, you know, Yahuwah, that it was not in insolence or pride or for any love of esteem that I did this and refused to bow down to this proud Haman. For I would have been willing to kiss the soles of his feet to deliver Yisrael. But I did this so that I might not set man's esteem above the esteem of Elohim. And I will not bow down to anyone but you, who are my master. And I will not do these things in pride. And now, Yahuwah Elohim and Sovereign, El of Abraham, spare your people. For the eyes of our foes are upon us to annihilate us, and they desire to destroy the inheritance that has been yours from the beginning. The other one mentions their, his ancient inheritance, or his peculiar possession from of old, I think was another way to put it. But the ancient inheritance or your ancient people is also what the uh, ancient history of Caledonia says about them because they were his people from of old, a nation taken out of, or made in a nation, right? But to continue, it says, do not neglect your portion, which you redeemed for yourself out of the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt. Hear my prayer and have chesed, loving kindness or mercy, upon your inheritance. Turn our mourning into feasting, that we may live and sing praise to your name. Yahuwah, do not destroy the lips of those who praise you. Now, right here, he prays that he would turn their mourning into feasting. So when he delivers them and they get to rejoice instead of suffer, that's when they turn it into a feast. Right? And all Yisrael cried out mightily, for their death was before their eyes. The queen Hadasha or Esther, seized with deadly anxiety, fled to Yahuwah. She took off her splendid apparel and put on the garments of distress and mourning. And instead of costly perfumes, she covered her head with ashes and dung. And she utterly humbled her body. Every part that she loved to adorn, she covered with her tangled hair. She prayed to Yahuwah Elohim of Yisrael and said, My Yahuwah, you only are our sovereign. Help me who am alone and have no helper but you, for my dangers are in my hand. Ever since I was born, I have heard in the tribe of my family that you, Yahuwah, took Yisrael out of all the nations and our ancestors from among all their forebears for an everlasting inheritance, and that you did for them all that you promised. And now we have sinned before you, and you have handed us over to our enemies because we esteemed their mighty ones. You are righteous, Yahuwah, and now they are not satisfied that we are in bitter slavery, but they covenanted with their idols to abolish what your mouth has ordained and to destroy your inheritance to stop the mouths of those who praise you and to quench your altar and the esteem of your house, to open the mouths of the nations for the praise of vain idols and to magnify forever a mortal king. Yahuwah, do not surrender your scepter to what has no being and do not let them laugh at our downfall. But turn their plan against them and make an example of him who began this against us. Remember, Yahuwah, make yourself known in this time of our affliction and give me courage. Sovereign of the Elohim and master of all dominion, put eloquent speech in my mouth before the lion and turn his heart to hate the man who is fighting against us so that there may be an end of him and those who agree with him. But deliver us by your hand and help me, who am alone and have no helper but you. Yahuwah, you have knowledge of all things, 
and you know that I hate the splendor of the wicked, and abhor the bed of the uncircumcised and of any alien. You know my necessity, that I abhor the sign of my proud position, which is upon my head on the days when I appear in public. I abhor it like a filthy rag, and I do not wear it on the days when I am at leisure. And your servant has not eaten at Haman's table, and I have not honored the king's feast or drunk the wine of libations, meaning the wine to false mighty ones, the offerings to, to demons, if you will. Your servant has had no joy since the day that I was brought here until now, except in you, Yahuwah Elohim of Abraham. Elohim, whose might is over all, hear the voice of the despairing, and deliver us from the hands of evildoers, and deliver me from my fear. On the third day, when she ended her prayer, she took off the garments in which she had worshipped, and arrayed herself in splendid attire. Then majestically adorned, after invoking the aid of the all-seeing El and Deliverer, she took two maids with her. On one she leaned gently for support, while, on the, or while the other followed carrying her train. She was radiant with perfect beauty, and she looked happy as if beloved. But her heart was frozen with fear, and she had gone through all the doors. Sorry, when she had gone through all the doors, she stood before the king. He was seated on his royal throne, clothed in full array of his majesty, and covered with gold and precious stones. He was most terrifying. Lifting his face flushed with splendor, he looked at her in fierce anger. The queen faltered and turned pale and faint, and collapsed on the head of the maid who went in front of her. Then Elohim changed the ruach of the king to gentleness, and in alarm he sprang from his throne and took her in his arms until she came to herself. He comforted her with soothing words and said to her, What is it, Esther? I am your husband. Take courage, you shall not die, for our law applies only to our subjects. Come near. Then he raised the golden scepter and touched her neck with it. He embraced her and said, Speak to me. She said to him, I saw you, my master, like a messenger of El, and my heart was shaken with fear at your esteem. For you are wonderful, my master, and your countenance is full of favor. And while she was speaking, she fainted and fell. Then Then the king was agitated, and all his servants tried to comfort her. The king said to her, What do you desire, Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, Today is a special day for me. If it pleases the king, let him and Haman come to the dinner that I shall prepare today. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther or Hadasha desires. So they both came to the dinner that Esther had spoken about. While they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, what is, or what is it? Queen Esther, it shall be granted you. She said, my petition and request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, let the king and Haman come to the dinner that I shall prepare them, and tomorrow I will do as I have done today. So Haman went out from the king joyful and glad of heart. But when he saw Mordecai the Yahudi in the courtyard, he was filled with anger. 
Nevertheless, he went home and summoned his friends and his wife, Zosara, and he told them about his riches and the honor that the king had bestowed on him and how he had advanced him to be the first in the kingdom. And Haman said, The queen did not invite anyone to the dinner with the king except me, and I am invited again tomorrow. But these things give me no pleasure as long as I see Mordecai the Yahudi in the courtyard. His wife, Zosara, and his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made fifty cubits high, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the dinner. This advice pleased a man, and so the gallows was prepared. Mordecai's reward from the king. That night, Yahuwah took the sleep from the sovereign, so he gave orders to his secretary to bring the book of daily records and to read to him. He found the words written about Mordecai, how he had told the king about the two royal eunuchs who were on guard and sought to lay hands on King Arxerxes. The king said, what honor or dignity did we bestow on Mordecai? The king's servants said, you have not done anything for him. While the king was inquiring about the goodwill shown by Mordecai, Haman was in the courtyard. The king asked who was in the courtyard. Now Haman had come to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared. The servants of the king answered, Haman is standing in the courtyard. And the king said, Summon him. Then the king said to Haman, What shall I do for the person whom I desire to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? So he said to the king, For a person whom the king desires to honor, let the king's servants bring out the fine linen robe that the king has worn and the horse on which the king rides, and let both be given to the one of the king's honored friends, and let him robe the person whom the king loves, and mount him on the horse, and let it be proclaimed through the open square of the city, saying, Thus shall it be done to everyone whom the king honors. Then the king said to Haman, You have made an excellent suggestion. Do just as you have said for Mordecai the Yahudi, who is on duty in the courtyard, and let nothing be omitted from what you have proposed. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He put the robe on Mordecai and made him ride through the open square of the city, proclaiming, Thus shall it be done to everyone whom the king desires to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the courtyard. And Haman hurried back to his house mourning and with his head covered. Haman told his wife, Zosara, Zosara, sorry, and his friends what had befallen him. His friends and his wife said to him, If Mordecai is of the Yahudi people and you have begun to be humiliated before him, you will surely fall. You will not be able to defend yourself because the living L is with him. And it talks about how in, in the Proverbs and other places that that the snare they lay or the roll, the stone they roll falls back on them and their own foot is caught in the traps that they spring. This is something that we see for Haman right here as well. But it says, while they were still talking, the eunuchs arrived and hurriedly brought Haman to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Chapter 7. So the king and Haman went in to drink with the queen. And the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king said, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your petition and what is your request? It shall be granted to you, even to the half of my kingdom. 
And she answered and said, If I have found favor with the king, let my life be granted, me at my petition, and my people at my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, plundered, and made slaves, we and our children, male and female slaves. This has come to my knowledge. Our antagonists bring shame on the king's court. Then the king said, Who is this person that would dare to do such a thing? Esther, or Hadasha, said, Our enemy is this evil man, Haman. At this, Haman was terrified in the presence of the king and queen. The king rose from the banquet and went into the garden. And Haman began to beg for his life from the queen for he saw that he was in serious trouble. When the king returned from the garden, a man had thrown himself on the couch, pleading with the queen. The king said, Will he dare even to assault my wife in my own house? A man, when he heard, turned his face away. Then Bugathan, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, a man has even prepared a gallows for Mordecai, who gave information of concern to the king. It is standing at Haman's house, a gallows fifty cubits high. So the king said, Let Haman be hanged on that. So Haman was hanged on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. With that the anger of the king abated. On the very day, sorry, on that very day, King Arxerxes granted to Esther all the property of the persecutor Haman. Mordecai was summoned by the king, for Esther had told the king that he was related to her. The king took the ring that had been taken from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over everything that had been Haman's. Then she spoke once again to the king, and falling at his feet, she asked him to avert all the evil that Haman had planned against the Yahudim. The king extended his golden scepter to Esther, and she rose and stood before the king. Esther said, if it pleases you, and if I have found favor, let an order be sent rescinding the letters that Haman wrote and sent to destroy the Yahudim in your kingdom. How can I look on the ruin of my people? How can I be safe if my ancestral nation is destroyed? The king said to Esther, Now that I have granted all of Haman's property to you, and have hanged him on a tree because he acted against the Yahudim, what else do you request? Write in my name what you think best and seal it with my ring. For whatever is written at the king's command and sealed with my ring cannot be contravened or contrived. Sorry. The secretaries were summoned on the 23rd day of the first month. That is Nisan. In the same year, and all that he commanded with respect to the Yahudim was given in writing to the administrators and governors of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own language. The edict was written with the king's authority and sealed with his ring and sent out by couriers. He ordered the Yahudim in every city to observe their own laws to defend themselves, and to act as they desired against their opponents and enemies. On a certain day, the 13th of the 12th month, which is Adar, throughout all the kingdom of Arxerxes. The Decree of Arxerxes. The following is a copy of this letter. The great king Arxerxes to the governors of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, and to those who are loyal to our government, 
Many people, the more they are honored with the most generous kindness of their benefactors, the more proud do they become and not only seek to injure our subjects, but in their inability to stand prosperity, they even undertake to scheme against their own benefactors. They not only take away thankfulness from others, but carried away by the boasts of those who know nothing but goodness, or sorry, who know nothing of goodness, they even assume that they will escape the evil-hating right ruling of Elohim, who always sees everything. And often many of those who are set in places of authority have been made in part if responsible for the shedding of innocent blood and have been involved in irremediable calamities. By the persuasion of friends who have been entrusted with the administration of public affairs. When these persons, by the false trickery of their evil natures, beguile the sincere goodwill of their sovereigns. What has been wickedly accomplished through the pestilent behavior of those who exercise authority unworthily can be seen not so much from the more ancient records that we had or that we hand on as from investigation of matters close at hand. In the future, we will take care to render our kingdom quiet and peaceable for all by changing our methods and always judging what comes before our eyes with more equitable consideration. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, a Macedonian, really an alien to the Persian blood and quite devoid of our kindliness, having, it says in Josephus, oh, it says in Josephus that he's not a Macedonian, but that he was an Amicalite, the same as the ones that were Yahuwah lifted up his hand in an oath to destroy them for what they had done when they attacked the people in the wilderness from behind. It mentions specifically in Josephus that this was the fulfillment of his doing that because the Amicalites were the ones that were going to rise up against the Yahudim and they themselves were taken out in exchange. This is for Haman, the son of Hamadatha, a Macedonian, really an alien to the Persian blood and quite devoid of our kindliness, having become our guest, enjoying so fully the goodwill that we have for every nation, that he was called our father and was continually bowed down to by all as a person second to the royal throne. But unable to restrain his arrogance, he undertook to deprive us of our kingdom and our life, and with intricate craft and deceit asked for the destruction of Mordecai, our deliverer and perpetual benefactor, and of Esther, the blameless partner of our kingdom, together with their whole nation. He thought that by these methods he would catch us undefended, and would transfer the kingdom of the Persians to the Macedonians. But we find that the Yahudim, who were consigned to annihilation by this thrice accursed man, are not evildoers, but are governed by most righteous laws, and are children of the living Elohim, most high, most mighty, who has directed the kingdom both for us and our, for our ancestors, in the most excellent order. You will therefore do well not to put in execution the letters sent by Haman, son of Hamadatha, since he, the one who did these things, has been hanged at the gate of Susa with all his household. For Elohim, who rules over all things, has speedily inflicted on him the punishment that he deserved. Therefore, post a copy of this letter publicly in every place and permit the Yahudim to live under their own laws and give them reinforcements so that on the 13th day of the 12th month, Adar, on that very day, they may defend themselves against those who attack them at the time of oppression. For Elohim, who rules over all things, has made this day to be a joy for his chosen people instead of a day of destruction for them. 
Therefore, you shall observe this with all good order, or with all good cheer, rather, as a notable day among your commemorative festivals, so that both now and hereafter it may represent deliverance to you and the loyal Persians, but that it may be a reminder of destruction for those who plot against us. Every city and country, without exception, that does not act accordingly shall be destroyed in wrath with spear and fire. It shall be made not only impassable for men, but also most hateful to wild animals and birds for all time. Let copies of the decree be posted conspicuously in all the kingdom, and let all the Yahudim be ready on that day to fight against their enemies. So the messengers on horseback set out with all speed to perform what the king had commanded, and the decree was published also in Susa. Mordecai went out dressed in a royal robe and wearing a gold crown and a turban of purple linen. The people in Susa rejoiced on seeing him, and the Yahudim had light and gladness in every city and province wherever the, the decree was published. Wherever the proclamation was made, the Yahudim had joy and gladness, a banquet and a set apart or a festival day. And many of the Gentiles or nations were circumcised and became Yahudim out of fear of the Yahudim. Victory for the Yahudim, or of the Yahudim, rather. Chapter 9. Now on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is Adar, the decree written by the sovereign arrived. On that same day, the enemies of the Yahudim perished. No one resisted because they feared them. The chief provincial governors, the princes, and the royal secretaries were paying honor to the Yahudim because fear of Mordecai weighed upon them. The king's decree required that Mordecai's name be held in honor throughout the kingdom. Now in the city of Susa, the Yahudim killed 500 people, including Farsanistin, Delphon, Fazga, Faradatha, Bare, Sabacha, Mar Mesmia, Arufius, Arceus, Zabuthius, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Bogian, the enemy of the Yahudim, and they indulge themselves in plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa was reported to the king, and king or the king said to Esther, In Susa, the capital, the Yahudim have destroyed 500 people. What do you suppose they have done in the surrounding countryside? Whatever more you ask will be done for you. And Esther said to the king, Let the Yahudim be allowed to do the same tomorrow. Also, hang up the bodies of Haman's ten sons. Now she's only asking for the very thing because it's enjoined in scripture. It says, What the wrong one wanted to do to another, so it shall be done unto them, right? In the judgment against them. So the very day that they were doing that is a day that they plundered, but it was also the Sabbath on this calendar. So that's something, uh, something to keep in mind. So he permitted this to be done. Or I'm sorry, I didn't finish. Uh, what he wanted to be done to them, wiping out all of the Yahudim, happened to him. His entire family was wiped out because what the wrong one, you know, what they tried to do to another, it happens to them. All right, that was the whole point. So verse 14, it says, So he permitted this to be done and handed over to the Yahudim, the city, or of the city, the bodies of a man's sons to hang up. The Yahudim who were in Susa gathered on the 14th and killed 300 people, but took no plunder for a total of 700. Now the other Yahudim in the kingdom gathered to defend themselves and got relief from their enemies. 
They destroyed 15,000 of them, but did not engage in plunder. On the 14th day, they rested, because it's a Shabbat, right? And made the same day a day of rest, celebrating it with joy and gladness. The Yahudim who were in Susa, the capital, came together also on the 14th, but did not rest. They celebrated the 15th with joy and gladness. On this account, then, the Yahudim who were scattered around the countries outside Susa kept the 14th of Adar as a joyful holiday or festival and send presents of food to one another. So to rejoice on this day and to send food to one another in recognition of the deliverance given by Yahuwah. And this was for the Yahudim who were throughout the Persian kingdom exclusively. The northern kingdom in dispersion or anyone else not, not enjoying to keep it, this wasn't applying to at that time. All right, it says, sorry about that. It says, on the account, of, then the Yahudim who were scattered around the country outside Susa kept the 14th of Adar as a joyful festival and send presents of food to one another, while those who live in the large cities keep the 15th day of Adar as their joyful holiday or festival, also sending presents to one another. Mordecai recorded these things in a book and sent it to the Yahudim in the kingdom of Arxerxes, both near and far, telling them that they should keep the 14th and 15th days of Adar. For on these days the Yahudim got relief from their enemies. The whole month, namely Adar, in which their condition had been changed from sorrow into gladness, and from a time of distress to a set apart or a festival, was to be celebrated as a time for feasting and gladness and for sending presents of food to their friends and to the poor. So the Yahudim accepted what Mordecai had written to them, how Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Macedonian, fought against them and how he made a decree and cast lots to destroy them, and how he went into the king telling him to hang Mordecai, but the wicked plot he had devised against the Yahudim came back upon himself, and he and his sons were hanged. Therefore these days were called Purim, or lots, because of the lots, for in their language this is the word that means lots. And so because of what was written in this letter and because of what they had experienced in this affair and what had befallen them, Mordecai established this festival and the Yahudim took upon themselves, upon their descendants and upon all who would join them to observe it without fail. These days of Purim or Purim should be a memorial and kept from generation to generation in every city, family, and country. These days of Purim were to be observed for all time, and the commemoration of them was never to cease among their descendants. So it, it, it's specific, but it is still perpetual for them because their fathers enjoined it. So anyone who's a, a descendant of the Yahudim, should probably keep this in mind. Then Queen Esther, daughter of Aminadab, along with Mordecai, the Yahudi, wrote down what they had done and gave full authority to the letter about Purim or Purim. And Mordecai and Queen Esther, or Hadasha, established this decision on their own responsibility, pledging their own well being to the plan. Esther established it by decree forever. And it was written for a memorial. Chapter 10. The king levied a tax upon his kingdom, both by land and sea. And as for his power and bravery and the wealth and esteem of his kingdom, 
They were reckoned in the annals of the kings of the Persians and the Medes. Mordecai enacted with authority on behalf of King Artaxerxes and was great in the kingdom, as well as honored by the Yahudim. His way of life was such as to make him beloved to his whole nation. And Mordecai said, These things have come from Elohim. For I remember the dream that I had concerning these matters, and none of them has failed to be fulfilled. There was this little spring that became a river, and there was light and sun and abundant water. The river is Esther, whom the king married and made queen. The two dragons are Haman and myself. The nations are those that gathered to destroy the name of the Yahudim. And my nation, this is Yisrael, who cried out to Elohim and was delivered. Specifically, the Yahudim in the captivity. Right? Yahuwah has delivered his people. Yahuwah has rescued us from all these evils. Elohim has done great signs and wonders, wonders that have never happened among the nations. For this purpose, he made two lots, one for the people of Elohim and one for all the nations. And these two lots came to the hour and moment and day of decision before Elohim and among all the nations. And Elohim remembered his people and vindicated his inheritance. So they will observe these days in the month of Adar, or the twelfth month, on the fourteenth and fifteenth of that month with an assembly and joy and gladness before Elohim from generation to generation forever among his people, Yisrael. In the fourth year of the reign of Ptolemy and Cleopatra, Dositheus, who said that he was a priest and a Levite or a Kohen and a Louis, and the, his son Ptolemy brought to Mitzrayim, the preceding letter about Purim, which they said was authentic and had been translated by Lismascus, the son of Ptolemy, one of the residents of Yerushalayim. All right, and that would continue or finish the reading of the Greek or the apocryphal version of Esther, which is really the full version that they have in Josephus and in the Greek. So thank you all for your time and you have a wonderful Shabbat and week ahead.